Verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds. So Jesus Christ is going to come on clouds. And every eye shall see him. They're going to see him when he's coming on the clouds. And they also which pierced him. So the Jews which pierced him, they're going to see him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. They're going to weep. They're going to mourn when they see Jesus Christ coming. Even so, amen. Notice that this is distinguished from, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then I'm trying to squeeze it because I got a real good one right here at verse 10, but I don't think I'm going to get there. I got it. Oh, my goodness. I don't think I'm going to get there. So let's, let's see why I can do it. <laughs> we can wait for it, right? All right. Let me try to squeeze it as best as I can because it's a really good one. That's probably my favorite for today's study. So Revelation 1, 7 and 1 Corinthians 15, you'll notice that this is a public coming of Jesus. And there's a difference with that one compared to 1 Corinthians 15 with this one from Jesus Christ. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, in this coming, that there's a difference. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. See, so it's not where, so notice right here, every eye shall see, right? But this one is a twinkling of an eye. So it's like, boom, like that. So I blink. And then notice right here, it doesn't say in public, every eye shall see. But at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There's your rapture right here. Notice in verse 51, behold, I show you a what? Mystery. So this is a mystery. You'll notice a public coming, and then you'll notice a mystery right here. That's why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Why do you believe in that, Pastor? Because that is differentiated from his second advent right here. So a lot of people confuse the pre-tribulation rapture, and they combine that with Revelation 1-7, thinking that the rapture has to happen after the tribulation with everyone seeing Jesus, and he comes down and rule over the world. No, there's a big difference right here. There's a huge difference. As you look at eschatology right over here, as we're in the church age, this is differentiated from the tribulation. You'll notice that as this is going up, 1 Corinthians 15, twinkling of an eye, mystery. And then right here, people are going through the tribulation, and then they see Jesus Christ coming down. Every eye shall see him. Why? Because he's going to come down and rule over this world. That's why. Why is it here the twinkling of an eye? Simple, because Jesus Christ is picking us up. That's what rapture means. It's like raptor. It's like snatching, caught away. There's a difference with that and coming down and ruling over the world. If you don't differentiate the pre-tribulation rapture from the second advent, that's why you come across a lot of wrong doctrine online when they talk about end times. A lot, majority of that is contributed to a non-pre-tribulation point of view. All right, let's return to Revelation 1. All right, if you want me to squeeze it, I'll squeeze it. Here we go. Look at, look at verse 8. Jesus is speaking, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. So Jesus is beginning and end, which is, see present tense, and which was past tense, and which is to come, future the Almighty. Revelation 1.8 should be marked down to be used against Jehovah Witnesses. You might say, why? Because they teach that Jesus Christ is the firstborn, basically, of God's creation. So that's why he is a God. No. If you look at Revelation 1.8, he has no beginning or ending right there. He is. That's what he is. He's omnipresent. See, past, present, future cannot hold our Savior down. Amen. Notice that uh, some Jehovah Witnesses, they'll say Jesus is the mighty God, but not the Almighty. Well, look at Revelation 1.8, the Almighty. Yeah. Boo-hoo, okay? So Amen. notice right here, Revelation 1.8 will uh, annihilate the Jehovah Witnesses. Okay, let's look at verse 9. 
I, John, John is speaking, who also am your brother. John is a fellow brother and companion in tribulation. Now, this is very interesting. John is speaking as if he is our brother in Christ and a companion as well in the tribulation. It can be used for two things. For one thing right here, as for tribulation, is based off of uh, Romans chapter 5, I think. I could be wrong. But anyways, if you look up the word tribulation in your Bible, it simply means, as it says, it's a hardship. That's what it is. Yeah, Romans 5, 3. Yeah, Romans 5, 3 is an example. So if you look at Romans chapter... I can't believe I'm drawing so much at this teaching right here. Okay, all right. Uh, this is like the fifth time I'm erasing. <laughs> okay. So notice right here that at Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 3, I mentioned. As we equate that with Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9... John understands the suffering that we're going through. So this is used by sometimes post-tribulation rapture proponents who hate pre-tribulation rapture to prove Christians are in the tribulation. No, that's not true. If you look up that term tribulation at Romans 5.3, it can refer to anguish and suffering. Look at Romans 5.3. Isn't that what the line is referring to? Persecution, suffering. Don't Christians go through that same thing? Yes, we all go through the same thing together with John, so thus he is our companion. Now, let's give them the benefit of the doubt that this can refer to a tribulation timeline, okay? Let's give them that. So here's the second one, which is very interesting. Apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> so notice right here, if we're going to say John is speaking about the end times of tribulation, what's very interesting is this. Look at the next part. And in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Notice that he is also in that kingdom and within that patience. If you read Revelation 12 and Revelation 14, the patient of the saints who are going through the tribulation. And they're going through the tribulation of the Antichrist. Patience and they're waiting for that kingdom to come. The simple answer is, notice that John, in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Notice chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. What's going on is that John, he is going within that timeline right there. The Lord transports him into that timeline. And then that's why what is so interesting in the book of Revelation, you'll notice him speaking as if he is in it right now, even though that hasn't happened yet. So that is a, another good, interesting term, why John, we could see right here, it could be referring to a tribulation epistle. But this would support more on our side of a dispensational teaching, not an anti-dispensational post-millennial point of view. This is more supporting a dispensational aspect that this book in your Bible is applied to the tribulation timeline, not Christians in the church. See? So rightly dividing things to the right time period and group of people. That's what dispensationalism means. We don't believe all books in our Bible apply to us. If you do it that way, then we might as well stone everyone to death for breaking the Sabbath, for taking God's name in vain. We know that those verses apply to a different group of people, different timeline, just like Revelation is as well. All right, let's wrap this up. Second part of verse 9. Was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God. So John was exiled. See, he was under persecution. So he was in an isle called Patmos. Why? For the word of God, for standing up for God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, for having a good testimony for Jesus. Uh, it is said that, I could be wrong about this, from, but from what I heard from some commentators at the Isle of Patmos, that um, it's like almost at sea level. It's probably like just a couple feet above sea level, that's it. So then it's like a small, dinky little island that you can really get killed real quick. <laughs> but uh, it is also said, according to some sources, that John the Apostle was working at the salt mines of that isle that time too. So it could be possible. All right, the one that I want to do. Here we go. Yeah. Verse 10. 
I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So John is saying that he's right now in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, the Lord's day is wrongly used by some people to think as Sunday. But no, that's not, the, that's not what the Lord's Day is referring to. Notice it's Lord's Day, right? His Day, right? Yes. Doesn't that equal with this term you see in the Bible? Day of the Lord. Now look at that. Now look up Day of the Lord in your Bible and see if that refers to Sunday. Yeah. That does not refer to Sunday. The Day of the Lord cometh, where people will scream, gnash your teeth, and then blood all over you. He'll kill everybody in the city. Yeah, that's a typical Sunday, right? You know? <laughs> Maybe you'll feel like that when the preacher's preaching at you, but no, that's not it. So this, so this is utmost proof. John, the author, that you better be careful when you read his writings that it can refer to a tribulation timeline. So when Ray Comfort and Lordship Salvation uses first, first John is like Ray Comfort's favorite book, but that they use that book as in terms like you can, uh, that you have to show works out of your faith if you're really saved. But John was talking about tribulation. That's what you got to think about. So notice that he was in the Lord's spirit in the Lord's day while he's writing this. So remember, he has a tribulation mindset as an author when he's writing. That's historical grammatical interpretation, dispensationalism. You look at the history of the author as well as the word that he says. So he was in the spirit in the Lord's day. This is very interesting. Notice John was put in the timeline of the tribulation. I was in the spirit in the Lord's day right here. You got to move that timeline more forward, actually. You got to move that timeline more forward. So how you move that timeline more forward concerning about John, he is speaking in the present tense as if he is in the tribulation. So if you read chapter 2, Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, it consists of so many verses where it seems like you can lose your salvation, your name blotted out of the book of life. But he's speaking in the present tense to these churches. The simple answer is this. John, yeah, even though he's writing to these churches at the present tense, he's writing in the tribulation timeline. He was in the spirit in the Lord's day. See that? So he's writing as if he's writing toward the tribulation timeline. That is going to be very eye-opening when you read the Bible. But let me show you something even more interesting. And heard what? Behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Notice that John was right here in that timeline of the tribulation. And behind him was the trumpet. See, the trumpet voice. You notice that? Which is the rapture. So notice right here, he is speaking within a tribulation timeline. There's your goodie, and let's close. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.